Good morning, everybody. So, um, one thing about missing the drummer, uh, although I very much miss our drummer because he's a great guy, but uh, he's not feeling well this morning. But the one thing about is you can hear everybody singing so well. You agree with that? It I really? Mean, yeah. You yeah. You resonate. More, not yeah. to say we should get rid of the drummer by any means, but I have no intention of it. Yeah, but I miss him a lot. Um, but that that's such a great sermon illustration because we're talking about the church during this series. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for giving him a headache, uh, migraine. So anyway, um, not that he did. I hope not. But anyway, um, but that's a, that's a great sermon illustration because what the cool thing is when you hear everybody's voices together, what a testimony to God's family uh, and, and how awesome it sounds for us to worship together. Anyway, so um, today we are diving back into our Defined Church series. Uh, I talked a lot, I introduced it last week. That really, I think, and um, you know, this is my opinion. You guys can, you know, uh, decide your opinion after we're done with this. But uh, my opinion is that we've sold ourselves short on the definition of church. What is what is church? And today, I want to ask the question: um, Is where does God live? And uh, one of the, you know, you may hear this at times, and, and, and before I say this, I want to just kind of preface that I'm not necessarily being super critical of people, and I'm not going to like tell people that they're, like, if someone says one of these things, they're not necessarily against the Bible, but I still think, I, you know, it's something to, to, to think about. Um, when Hannah started preschool, um, she... Uh, one of the rules that they have is to don't run in God's house. Don't run in God's house, right? You guys have heard them say, people say that before. Um, you ever heard the, the say, you ever heard anybody say, maybe at a different church or maybe at this church, but don't, don't spill your coffee in God's house? Or have you ever heard anybody say, maybe probably not in this church because we don't care, you can bring your coffee in. Um, but, you know, sometimes you hear people say, don't bring your coffee in God's house or, you know, don't spill your coffee in God's house, right? Or um, it's a great day to be in God's house. I know I hear that often, you know, that it's a great day to be in God's house. And I understand the concept behind it is we're here gathered together. God meets us where we're at and, you know, we, but is this where God lives? Is this like God's, like, God's got a master bedroom and a, and a, and a sweet, ensuite bathroom somewhere in this facility? And I know that sound, kind of sounds goofy, like, why would I even ask that? But that, it, it, when you hear that comment, and when our kids hear that comment, oftentimes what they think is that God actually lives in this place. That in the churches, in the church buildings that are all around this city and all around other cities, that God actually lives in that building. That he has residence there, right? And so, because of that, oftentimes we're motivated to act differently within a church building than we would be outside of a church building because whether we actually believe this or not, probably we don't believe this, but it, it kind of subconsciously sneaks in that if we're not inside a church building, then we can act differently because God might not be there, right? So like if you're outside the church building, you can run, right kids? You can run freely. You don't have to worry about it. Or if you, you know, if you're outside the church building, you don't have to worry about, in, or outside your church building or your mom's living room, you don't have to worry about spilling your coffee or your, your, your uh, high C or whatever, right? Or if we're, you know, on, on Tuesday nights when we're hanging out at my house, like, well, we're not in God's house, so we don't have to act like we're in church, right? So we, our lives can be different outside of different contexts of where we're at, right? But I think that really, uh, that, uh, for one, I think that really kind of sells church, what the definition of church, really sells it short, for one. But two, two is a good point, but I can't remember what I was going to say. But anyway, it sells church short. short. It, it sells short the definition of what church is. Because church is much more than just a building that you attend. And churches is much more than, like I talked about last week, an institution that provides services for you or an event that you go to, to to get fed or to get something from it. And it's also more than just a, uh, it's just an address or whatever it, uh, the event, the address, um, the organization or the institution, like I talked about last week. It's more than that. And so what I want to talk about today is where does God live? 
Where does God live? And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. We're going to skip around a little bit today because in order for us to understand where God lives, we have to kind of look at his word uh, in a different, in a little diff- different way. So, um, so before I get into any of that, I want to start off by praying that God will be with us as we open his word, and then we're going to dive into where does God live, okay? So let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, I just thank you for your word, God. I thank you for how it speaks so directly to who we are and who you want us to be, God. I pray that we just invest some time in it today, Father, not, but not just today, Father. I pray that our, that our talk today, that our discussion today, that everything we're talking about today, even in our Sunday school classes and uh, whatever it might come up, God, would prompt us and motivate us to go into your word this week, God. Um, help us to be people of your word, shaped by your word, uh, in love with your word, and guided by your word. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in order for us to understand where God lives, we, got to, we kind of have to understand where God has lived, okay? So what I want to talk about is kind of a biblical understanding of the presence of God throughout biblical history, okay? And so I want to try to do this in a, in a, like a smaller, not, not take up the whole time by this. So I'm going to run through it really quickly. Uh, and this basically means I'm running through the entire Old Testament really quickly, not really the whole thing, but the idea behind it. Um, And we're just going to skip along a little bit, okay? So if you guys, we're not going to really open up the Bible and Old Testament. We're just going to kind of do an overview. So if you guys remember back in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1, where was God's presence? Where was God's house? Well, God's presence was among his people, right? He created Adam and Eve. He created them in his image. He created a garden for them to live in. And the Bible says that God was in the presence of man, that he was lived and walked amongst the mankind, right? So literally, God was in the presence of man. So then we have a separation that happens with sin, right? Adam and Eve sin in the garden. They rebel against God. God moves them out of the garden. God in his presence with people is separated because of sin. God is holy. Man is no longer holy. And so for that reason, there has to be a separation, right? And so then there's a season where God isn't with his people. He is, he is present. He, is, he, he makes in, in interventions into, uh, into humankind. You hear him talking to Abraham and, and Isaac and all those different things, but we don't see God's presence, um, we don't see God's presence really make man, kind of manifest itself again until we get into the season of the tabernacle and the temple, right? So with Moses, Moses is kind of the introduction of God's presence in with his people again, right? And Moses creates, God it, it kind of gets Moses to create and to, to build the tabernacle, right? And the tabernacle really is just a tent. It's just a tent, and God in that tent is a pre- is God's presence in that tent through the uh, through the the Ark of the Covenant and through the Ten Commandments and all those things. God is in in amongst His people. And if you want to connect with God, then you connect with God through the tabernacle, and that's where the presence of God lived, if you will. Now God lives everywhere. His presence is everywhere. He's omnipresent, as the Bible says. But with His people, His His the manifestation of His presence that where He where He in a, in a sense lived was in the tabernacle. Later on, God you know God decides that He wants His people to build Him a temple, and so He kind of uh, gets some people gets gets David on that, and then David goes into Solomon, and so Solomon is is in charge of. Dealing buildings God's temple. And so Solomon builds God a nice temple, a beautiful temple in Jerusalem. um, And he builds the temple. And then God's presence is in that temple, right? And in that temple, there are, um, there is different, you know, different kind of sections of the temple. And one of those sections of the temple is the very center of of the temple. And it's the Holy of Holies. And so God's presence is in the Holy of Holies, the very central room of the temple. And in order for someone to go into the presence of God, they have to be of a particular priestly class, and they have to go through a ritualistic sort of thing in order to get into the presence of God, right? So they have to basically make themselves holy through the things that God has given them. They have to make themselves holy in order to enter the presence of God, right? And it was a very motivating thing because if you walked into the Holy of Holies and you weren't holy enough, 
Tradition says that they would tie a rope around your waist. And so if you weren't holy enough and you walked into the holies of, holy of holies, you would instantly die and they would have to drag you out with a rope after a little bit. Because after a little bit, they'd be like, well, where's this dude at? Let's drag him out with a rope and then he would be dead. So it was motivating, right? It was a motivation to be holy because if you weren't holy enough and you were entering the presence of God, then you were going to die. So that was, that was the uh, uh, Temple of Solomon. And then we go through generations and generations. The temple is, is ransacked and all these different things happen and the Jewish people go off into exile. And then we get to kind of the tradition of the Jews in the day of Jesus. And the temple, uh, the temple now is Herod's temple. And I want to throw up a picture of Herod's temple real quick. So as you can see, Herod's temple, I've got, if you see that yellow block up in the top, uh, kind of the top middle there, and right next to it is the, uh, it's a, that's, that's, a res, that's the, um, what it looks like American football, that's the size of American football field, okay? So if you look at the holy place and the women's courtyard is what we're looking at here. So those are two different sections of the temple where people could come and congregate and be in the presence of Jewish people and, and that was kind of the religious traditions and stuff would happen within these places and then if you go in there's the priest courtyard and then you get into the holy place and then within that is the holy of holies okay but if you look at that yellow square look how big this mount was this was a big place it had this presence about itself right this, this temple in Jesus' day, the people would remember, would, would see would, when Jesus is talking about this, when the writers of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the Bible books were talking about the temple, this is what they would have imagined. This is what they were seeing in their brains, is this huge building, right? Go to the next slide. Now you can see a little bit bigger. This is actually Herod's temple grounds. This is actually the, 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 where the walls of the temple would start, right? The middle, middle section is what we just looked at, but then if you look at all the big walls around it, if you see that yellow square again, that's another. That's an American football field. That's the size of an American football field. Not the big yellow square, but the one that, the black one that has the yellow around it. That's the size of a football field that we kind of know today, 50 yards by 100 yards, right? And then you can see that there's like four football fields that would fit inside of this. It's huge. It's got this big presence about it, right? Now go to the next slide. Now you can see up in the very top, that is the, um, that is the temple. And then all around that is the city of Jerusalem. So the, in the city of Jerusalem, if you look at that, if you, as you look at that, it was, it was a huge place. It's a huge structure, right? And it was on the top of a hill, and it overlooked Jerusalem, and you could clearly see the temple from all around, right? It was awe-inspiring in its size and its adornment. It had gold adorning everything, and it had just this presence about it that was beautiful. You guys have probably seen temples from other religion, tr religious traditions. You've probably seen cathedrals that are just these beautiful these beautiful buildings that almost like drive you to awe like they're awe inspiring when you look at them right and in, and if you were if you were um, to be in God's presence you were to go to this temple and when when you looked at this temple it was almost like it would drive you to a kind of an awe inspiring moment of looking at that and saying that's where God's presence was and what a big presence he had Look at, a, look at how big the presence was in the city of Jerusalem. People would come from miles around to attend the temple, right? And because they were in the temple, they would, they would, they would live their lives in certain kinds of ways, right? It would motivate them in certain ways to live a particular way. So if we're moving forward, so this is, this is Jesus comes into a culture that thinks God's presence, thinks of God's presence, that considers God's address, if you will, the temple. And that's where God lives. That's where God's presence is amongst his people. And so then Jesus enters the picture. In John chapter 2, 19 through 21, Jesus makes a comment about the temple. So he is in the temple at this point. And Jesus says in verse 18, he says, So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show? What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answers them, destroy this temple that I'm sitting in, the one that we can see up here that we saw in just a second ago. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But the writer John says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So then it says of the disciples, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So there's a transition that happens at the birth of Jesus. There's a transition that happens when Jesus enters the picture. The transition is from God's presence being in the temple to God's presence being physically in the man named Jesus. Jesus was both God and man. So when Jesus was God, the incarnate God-man, the presence of, of God moved from the temple to Jesus. And so now people, when they experience, when at this particular point, when people wanted to experience the presence of God, Jesus was saying they're going to experience through me. So when he was telling the Jews, in order for you to understand, if you can destroy the, this temple, but in three days I'm going to raise it back up again, all the Jewish people said, well, how can he destroy this mammoth building that has taken us, they said 46 years, but it's actually much longer than that. That's the, you know, the, the, where they were at right now, they kind of finished it off in 46 years, but ultimately it was much longer than that. But he says, but they're saying, so how do you expect on, how do you expect to build this, this thing back in three days in which it took us 46 years? Because their brains think of God's presence and God's house being the temple. But now Jesus is mixing things up again, right? And so... Um, if you if you think back to and and, and uh, think back in, at at the point of Jesus' death, the Bible says that when Jesus died, um, the curtain that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the world was torn in half. And what that represents, when the Bible talks about that, that represents the separation between sin that, that had separated man for thousands of years and, and that required man to build this elaborate temple in order for them to have the presence of God amongst them. This separation was no longer present. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the presence of God had moved from the temple into Jesus, and now this sin had, had been, the sin that had separated us for, for thousands of years was broken and it opened up and ushered in the opportunity for God's presence to exist outside of the temple. That's the whole idea of this Holy of Holies being opened up to all man, right? So then we enter the third stage. And the third stage is God's presence with us, the Holy Spirit. God's presence with us. If you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus talks about this happening, right? Right? Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, this is Jesus talking to the disciples, and he says, um, verse 7, it was not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus at this point is telling the disciples, okay, so in a, in a while, in a short period of time, you, the presence of God will enter into you. Because of what I've done on the cross, because of me dying on the cross and, and being buried in a grave and three days later raising from the, from the dead, the presence of God can now exist again amongst his people and even in his people through the Holy Spirit. And so then if you run forward to, to verses uh, uh, 1 through 4 in chapter 2, of Acts, it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as fire appeared to them, and rested on each, of them, each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time, I'm not going to spend any time on the speaking in tongues part, but just understand that that was an amazing experience of when God's presence entered mankind. And so we moved from the stage where God's presence was with his people in the form of a temple or a tabernacle. The, the presence of God moved into Jesus, the person, the God-man Jesus. And now we have the presence of God that has entered humankind. And now ultimately we have become the temples of God. And so that's just my introduction, okay? So now I want to really dive into the meat of things because 
the fact that we have the presence of God living inside of us, that God's house is no longer a place you go to, but is you and us corporately, there's something that happens in us. It changes who we are. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about a few passages of Scripture, and there's two things that I want us to walk away with today. Is the first thing is that you are the temple of God. The second thing I want us to walk away with is that we are the temple of God. Now I want to describe what that means, okay? So, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, this is a big section, but I'm just going to focus in on a couple of verses, okay? If you look at, starting in verse 12, Paul is talking to the people, um, the Corinthian church. And so let me give you just a little context. The Corinthian church was a mess. The, Corinth was a mess. Corinth was like one of those cities, like Las Vegas, if you will. Is a lot, well, way many people have described Corinth, Corinth. Corinth was a mess. Had all kinds of sin and debauchery and mess. And, and people were, 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 had all kinds of different beliefs. It was a port city, so there was all kinds of influence that was coming in from all around the world. All around the Roman world at this time. And so Cor Corinth, the Corinthian church, had a lot of questions. And in, the, in verse 12, one of the things that is included in one of the letters, that was given to Paul from the church in Corinth, and this is a statement that they made in the letter. It says, all things are lawful for me. And you can see in most of your Bibles that that's going to be in quotation marks. What we believe is that that literally came out of a letter, that Paul was quoting from a letter that they had given him, right? If you go down to the, uh, down just another line, it says, all things are lawful for me, again, in quotations. Verse 13, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach is for food. Another quotation. We believe that those are quotations from the Corinthian church that Paul is overthrowing, that Paul is encountering, if you will, and giving an answer to. In some ways, they were questions. And so Paul is, is answering these questions, right? So Paul says, all things are lawful for me. But then Paul's response is, but not all things are helpful. Then he says, all, then they say again, all things are lawful for me. But Paul says, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Do you see how he's overthrowing some of their philosophy? See, what was happening amongst the people is they believed that their body and their spirit were separated. And that's an ancient heresy that, you know, of, of, of Christians from years and years. We still even deal with this today, that the body is separate from the spirit and different kinds of heresies. But basically what they were saying is, whatever I do to my body doesn't affect my spirit. And so if I want to sleep with a bunch of different people, it doesn't affect me. It only affects my body. If I want to overindulge in alcohol or food or whatever it is, it doesn't affect my body. It just, it, 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 in my, because my body and my spirit are separate. So I can do the spiritual stuff and those things are good for nurturing for my spirit and my body, whatever I do to my body, it doesn't affect my spirit. So you guys get the picture is they were, they were living lives of debauchery. They were living lives of gluttony. They were living lives of alcoholism and abuse of different kinds of substances because they didn't feel like it would, their body and their soul, their body and their spirit was, were affected by one another. So Paul is overthrowing these things, right? So he says, all things are lawful, but all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things, but I will not be enslaved by anything. So God, and so they say food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but, the Lord, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So Paul is, is directly encountering, directly um, uh, overthrowing the idea that their body and their soul are separated, okay? So, if, so with that kind of as our context, go down to verse 19. Um, we'll start off in verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So again, he's creating this idea that no, your soul and your, and your body are not separate. They're, they're intertwined. And what you do with your body is a direct reflection on what's going on in your soul and how you're feeding your soul. So then he says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So 
what he's dealing with, he's dealing with sexual promiscuity. Um, he, uh, he's, he's, he's saying that we are, that yes, although we are free to use our bodies how we want, there is, there's restrictions and there's, 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 um, there's a way for us to think of our bodies, right? So speaking that, he's speaking to each person individually in this passage. And he's speaking to indi- individuals that, they're, that help them understand that their, their bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And our bodies, te- are, by being temples, are bought by God, and we are not our own, as he says in the passage. We have literally, the temples that we own, there are bodies that we think are our own, are literally God's. God has bought them on the cross with, his, with, his, uh, with the life of his son, right? So, with this as our kind of our idea, we are encouraged here. There's an encouragement Paul has an intention of encouraging us as well as motivating us. So the encouragement here is we are temples of the Holy Spirit, meaning inside of us the Holy Spirit exists. And because of the Holy Spirit's presence in us, we have power over sin. We have the presence of God that lives with us. And so no longer do we have to go to God uh, in a temple or go to God in a particular building, but ultimately we have the presence of God in us. But then that also leads to some motivations. And so I have four motivations, or three motivations, that are kind of lead out of the fact that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. The first of our motivations is this, that because we are the temples of the Holy Spirit, we have a motivation for purity. We have a motivation for purity. Our motivation for purity and holiness is not a location, but it's our identity. In the Old Testament, or in the idea that, the, that God resides in a building, our motivation for purity, our motivation for, for seeking purity in our lives, sexual purity or spiritual purity in our lives, was or we were motivated by a particular address. So when you were at the temple or when you were at the building where God existed, then you were motivated to purity in that place. And so you would purify yourself through rituals and through, uh, through sacrifices and things like that. But no longer is that necessary for us because the ultimate price has been paid on the cross for the penalty of our sins and Jesus has freed us from the laws and from, the sin, from sin that has affected our ability to connect with him. And so now our motivation for purity is not to come in the presence of God, but our motivation for purity is the fact that the presence of God exists inside of us. We want our temple to be pure because Jesus, because God, because the Holy Spirit resides in us. And that's the motivation for our purity is the fact that Jesus resides in us, that the Holy Spirit resides in us. Second motivation is a motivation for prudence. That word prudence is a weird word, but ultimately it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's basically an understanding that what I'm doing today affects my future. If you look at Proverbs 14.8, it says, The prudent understand where they are going, but fools deceive themselves. If we live by the idea that it feels good now, we are being fools with our bodies. In order for us to glorify God with our bodies, we must seek to be prudent and wise and know where we are going, right? And that affects the way we use our bodies, If Jesus, if the Holy Spirit resides in us, then we should desire to use our bodies to glorify him because we should be, in effect, like the temple that was used to glorify God and to to usher people into his presence. Our bodies should be used to usher people into God's presence. And so it should motivate us to prudence. And now that doesn't mean that we're a bunch of prudes, that we never do anything fun. But it means that we think about the way we use our body. See, our culture is driven by whatever feels good. And if it feels good, that's what I'm going to go and do. So we're, 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 we pursue sex outside of marriage. We pursue gluttony. We pursue alcoholism and drug abuse. We pursue those things thinking that that's what my body wants right now and so that's what I'm going to run after. When in, in effect, we don't understand the effects that sin and the effects of using our bodies against God's ways and his plans, how that affects us in the future. One of the ways that affects us in the future is we become unhealthy, obviously. We destroy our lives. Alcoholism and drug abuse destroy our lives. And ultimately, by some of these ways that we're using our bodies, we're ultimately not using them to glorify God. And so we might not be in the presence of God at all. 
And so in the future, if we're just living based on what, as Ephesians chapter one, or chapter two says, that if we're driven by just by what our bodies, the longings of our bodies, that ultimately is our home in heaven or in hell with, with Satan. Because if we are going to be Christians, then it should affect the way we live. If we say we're Christians, it should affect the way we live. And so the last thing is, and kind of bounces off of this, but it's a little bit deeper, a little bit more practical, is it should have a, we should have a motivation for taking care of ourselves. So not only a motivation for, puri or for puri purity and prudence, but a motivation for taking care of ourselves. Because if our body is a temple, then the way we eat, the way we drink, the way we exercise, whether we smoke or chew tobacco, the, our sleeping habits, all of those things should be infect affected by the fact that we are vessels of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Now, I should be talking because I overeat a lot and I don't, you know, that's, that's something I'm working on and I pray for your help in that. But nonetheless, um, Pam and I had a conversation this week just about, you know, she was giving a talk on, uh, on this particular topic at the women's conference yesterday and she just got this feeling that ah, I'm just not practicing these things the way I feel like I should and yet I'm going to go talk to them about them on Saturday. I said, well, Pam, I get up every Sunday and talk about things that I... I'm not doing a very good job with. So it's not necessarily that God calls the uh, equipped, but he equips the called, right? So all that to say, I'm telling you that you need to eat healthy because you're a temple, because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you that you don't need to overindulge in alcohol because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying you need to exercise and regularly exercise because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Smoking and chewing tobacco, is there anything in the Bible that says that's a sin? No. But it's not good for you. My dad is on oxygen full time right now because of, of, of smoking for years and years. I don't wish that upon anybody. And so I'm telling you, alcohol, drink, drinking too much, smoking and chewing tobacco and doing drugs are not good for you. And so let us not do those things. Let's fight against those things because God wants our bodies to be healthy. And we need to sleep. I mean, I can go in. This could be like a whole sermon altogether. And Anita probably could tell, tell you most of these things. But, um, but what I'm saying, we need to take care of our bodies because our bodies are, the, are our temples of the Holy Spirit. But not just because of that. That is a big motivating factor. But because we have people that count on us. And we want to be healthy. And so I think that's a motivating factor with this. Now, I'm way out of time, but I'm going to keep going, okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now I want to talk really quickly, and I should have spent more time on this than the other one, but here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. I'm just going to read that real quick. So um, the, Paul, just give you a little bit of context. This is the same letter, and Paul is talking about unity within the body of Christ. So he's going to use the same sort of language in this passage that he did in, verse, in chapter 6. But what, what he's going to say here that's different is he's going to use words that are more plural rather than singular. And so when he's talking uh, in this passage... He's talking to the whole congregation, not just to individuals, okay? So here we go. Do, not, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So you get that? So he's talking about the temple of God as, a, as, as in the group of people, as in the congregation, the ecclesia of Scripture, the assembly of believers, the church as the temple of God. Now, he's not talking about a particular structure. In this particular context, the Corinthian church was a group of house churches. They would meet in homes all across the city of Corinth, and there were different ones that met in different homes. And so when he's talking about the temple of God, he's literally talking about someone's thatch roof house or whatever they built houses with their rock or mud or whatever it was. He's literally talking about not that building, but where, but the congregation that would meet there. And so he, he says with strong words that if anyone destroys God's temple, if anyone destroys the unity of the body of Christ that meets inside of these homes, he says, if anyone destroys the temple, God will destroy him. You see how, how sternly Paul speaks about church unity, about us being unified. When we think of ourselves as a building, 
When we think that church is a building, we think that, you know, well, it doesn't matter if we believe all the same things, or it doesn't matter if we really like each other. All we're doing is going to the building, and that's where I meet God, and then I go home and live my life. Do you see how that sells church short? Because that's not Paul's understanding of what the church is. The church isn't a building that you go to. It's the people. And so unity is essential in, for us to have, to, to be the church that God wants us to be. And so what does it mean for us to be unified? I think there's, there's four ways, and really three ways, and then an application point, three ways that we are to be unified as a body of believers. And, and, and this is important for us to understand the role of church leadership as well, because in circumstances, church leadership, not just me and Andy, but church leaders step into situations in order to maintain unity in the, in the church. And so here's the first one, the priority, the first priority of, of maintaining church unity or us being the temple of God, the first priority is theological unity. If you, if you look at uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse 20, and again, I'm going to pop around a lot here. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 says, um, and I'll read verse 19 first. We're going to get to 19 in just a second. But it says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are now fellow citizens when this, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are being built together into a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So if you see, the, the idea that Paul is talking about in this passage is, that he's presenting in this passage, is literally a, a temple of God being built up from his people. And the thing that that, that temple is built on is, God, is, the, is the prophets, the teaching of the prophets, meaning God's word, the apostles and the prophets, which gave us God's word, and then also the cornerstone of Jesus. And so for us to be united, we have to be united around shared belief. That we all believe in the, in the doctrines that unite, the, the things that, 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 we, that are, are found in this Bible. Now, there are things that we're not going to agree on. There's open-handed issues that we're not going to agree on. There's certain things, and we can talk about those a different day. There's certain things that we don't have to agree on as a church. But the things that we're going to agree on and we have to agree on in order to be the, the strong, healthy church that God wants us to be, to be united theologically, we have to believe that this word is true. That it's the inerrant word of God, that there's no error and there's no false in, uh, falsity in this book. That, and we have to devote ourselves to reading it and knowing it and studying it and learning it more and more. And letting it shape our lives more and more. You can't let me be the guy that does all the theological education for the church. You have to do it yourself. Because I might say something that's wrong. And then you have to come and talk to me. And correct me. And say, I don't think you're right there. And we can have a discussion. And we can get to uh, kind of understand um, what, 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 where we're off there. And how we can, how do we can kind of come together on that. Because we have to have theological unity. If we are to be united in belief, we must know what we believe together. And theological unity comes out of our commitment to learning and growing together. I chose my word specifically there. Because theological unity comes out of our, of, of our commitment to learn together. You guys remember our four L's? Living, learning, loving, leading, right? The second priority is a priority of, of relational unity. If you go back to that Ephesians passage, did you see what he said in the first part, in verse 19? He said this. Um, he's talking to the, F, the, Ephes, the church in Ephesus, and he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So the, the identity of us being the temple of God, that our church, our, 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 our each individual person makes up a temple of God, and then we together collectively make up the temple of God, then we must maintain relational unity. We must be committed to relational unity because we're no longer strangers and aliens. The identity as the church of God means that we are no longer strangers and aliens, and now we're a part of a community, and that community is a part of God's household. We're a part of the household of faith. I'm going to talk about us being the family of God in a couple weeks, but 
Ultimately, at this point, we're, 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 we're getting a glimpse at the fact that thus being the, us being the temple of God means that we're also a family, that we're also the household of God. And relational unity comes out of our commitment to living life together for the good of one another. Do you, you catch that? In order for us to be theologically unified, we have to can be committed to learning together. In order for us to be relationally unified, we have to be committed to living life together. Living, learning, right? And here's the last one, the priority of missional unity. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. I love this passage. It says this, as you, come in, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but not in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. What Paul is doing here is he's, he's, he's creating a picture in our minds of, a, of us as individuals being built up and, and, and putting, putting together a wall, right? If you've ever watched a, a stone wall or a brick wall being built, they just stack one stone at a time, right? And each one of us is that stone, is a stone. And God is stacking each one of us into this, into this temple, into this, into this a theory, a theor theoretical, if you will, not a physical temple, but a theoretical temple that we are ultimately becoming a temple for God's presence. And, but that temple is not without purpose. That temple is not just something to sit as an ornament in, inside the city walls. It's ultimately a temple that it has a purpose to be, as it says here, you yourself like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And that holy priesthood is ultimately what he's saying is that we're supposed to be the link between God and God's presence to the world. We are a holy temple, and God has put us there to put himself on display to the world. So, in order for us to have um, missional unity, in order for us to, be, to, have a, uh, to, to, to maintain missional unity, um, we have to have a commitment to love others through service and to lead others to Jesus by going and making disciples. So you see how our mission as a church and who we are as a church is wrapped up in this identity that we are God's house. You individually are God's house and we corporately are God's house. We have to maintain theological unity by being committed to learning more about Jesus together. We have to maintain relational community and be committed to one another by living in community with one another. And we have to, 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 to be, have the priority of missional unity by loving everyone around us and one another and also by leading others to Jesus. So, one of the... The two things I wanted to, to leave you guys with today, again, to restate them, is that you are the temple of God. And that should be a motivation for how you use your body. And secondly, that we are the temple of God. So let's be committed to unity. And there are two expressions that the Bible gives us. There's two outward expressions that the Bible gives us. And this is so cool that we get to experience both of these expressions today as a community, as a, as a family. The first exp one of the first expressions God gives us is Jesus is baptized in, uh, in the very beginning of his ministry. And that, that symbolism of baptism is something that God placed in his great commission as he sent us out. I talked about this a few weeks ago, that the great commission is that you, we go, therefore, and, make, and, and, bapt, and go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I talked about how baptism is really what it is, is an, ex, is a, an outward expression of what's happened inside of us. That when we come to know Jesus, that we, are, we die to our old self and are risen to a new life. <laughs> 
And so today we get to experience that. Lori Render uh, and Emma Render are getting baptized in the 930 service right after the announcements. So if you want to come back for that, we welcome you back at the 930 service. You don't have to stay for the whole thing. But if you want to come back for the baptism, because what that is, that's, and I told them this week, that this week, that this baptism, when they're being baptized, what we're doing is we're uniting them with thousands and millions and, and of believers that have existed throughout the ages that have been baptized in the same way as they're being baptized, that they're joining the family of God. Now, they're already, they're already members of the family of God, but this is the initiation, if you will. And we get to join together to, as, as believers to experience this particular thing together. The second expression that God gives us in the, in the, uh, in the Bible um, is through the Lord's Supper. And so it's cool that this lined up, that we were able to, pre- to, to do both of these um, together today. Because the Lord's Supper is an expression of the, the, the unity that we share together. And really it's doctrinal unity, but it's also relational unity. We're, we're proclaiming, when we take the Lord's Supper together, we're proclaiming that Jesus died for us, that his body was broken for our sins, that his blood was shed for our sins. And then every time we take the Lord's Supper, that we're proclaiming his death until the day that he comes, until the day that he returns. But we do that together. It's not something that God said, okay, so when you're at home right before you go to bed, you need to drink a little juice and eat a little bread. But he says, when you gather together, do these things. Because we're proclaiming Jesus' death. We're proclaiming that we're a part of, we're taking in God, taking in Jesus. We're taking in the sacrifice every time that we do that. There's nothing particularly important. There's nothing particularly um, powerful about the bread and the juice that we're drinking and eating today. But the expression of Jesus' death on the cross for our sins and that, that we're taking that in every, every, when we gather together, that's the, that's the key of it. And so what I want to do, what I want to do right now, I'm going to pray. And then Andy's going to come forward and actually lead us in, in, the, uh, in the time of, of the Lord's Supper. But we're, this is our time of response. And so you respond however God leads you to respond, but ultimately this is your time to respond. And so if you, if you need to, to stop and pray at the altar before you take the Lord's Supper or after you take the Lord's Supper, you can do that. Um, just make sure you keep the aisle clean, uh, the aisle kind of straight. But ultimately, um, this is our opportunity to respond. And so if you've been convicted and you want to trust in Jesus today, um, I'll make myself available. Andy will make himself available at some time uh, during this time. But let's take, let's join together as we are unified through the, the body and blood of Christ. Let's join together in taking the Lord's Supper. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, God. Thank you for your grace, God. Thank you that we have this amazing expression of unity through this sacrament, this this. Um, this thing that we do, God, this beautiful picture of the of body and blood of Christ that was broken and shed for us, God. God, as we, um, as we do this together, Father, I pray that it preaches to our hearts. Um, that it preaches to our hearts the significance of the event of you dying on the cross and raising from the dead, Father. God, thank you that we can do this together as a family, and I pray that we would be a family that's unified, God, theologically, relationally, missionally unified. And God, use uh, this time um, just as another opportunity for us to worship you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.